Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Globsec 2017. The year 2017. Adapting our institutions. Adapting democracy to the digital age. Adapting to the fourth industrial revolution. How do we adapt to the future and have the future adapt to us? These are the core issues to be addressed here. Making our world a safe, prosperous and sustainable place. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the honorary chairman of Globsec, Mr. Rastislav Katcher, to the stage. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's again me, you know, you got this as a punishment to compensate all of those young, nice faces of our team. And always, I'm, before I'm coming here, I'm just horrified how this is all going to go. But this train already left the station, he's on the rails. And hopefully, thanks to the organizers, organizers and all of you, this will all go well. President, Mrs. President, in 12 Globsec here in uh, the hotel at the bank of the Danube. And you saw in the short video that there is a headline, a theme uh, for this year. Globsec is adopting in the brackets to the future. And this is precisely uh, the essence of what we've been trying to do with Globsecs in the past. I'm of those, when I teach students at the university, they call me um, Darwinist in politics because I think that the evolution of humanity is driven by the same principles as evolution of species. And it's cruel, but it's very simple. Either you adapt to changing an environment, you survive and you thrive, or you do not and you go down the hill. The forum Globsec is one of those events when we try to comprehend uh, where the world is going on and to adapt uh, to the future in terms of what kind of policy making, what industrial policies, uh, what kind of input from the think tanks uh, to help the process. Feels like all of people, most of the people think that the world is getting into dynamics, which is like you sit on the merry-go-round and it's spinning and it keeps spinning faster and there is no handbrake on which you can brake. And it, you know, you get dizzy, you may feel bad on the stomach, well, what to do, you know? Truth is that world is spinning at a higher speed and this Darwinistic human capacity of adaptation is at certain pace. But when we come to the point where the dynamics of the world dictated by technological change diverts too much and the gap starts to open, this can create serious point of disbalance and uncertainty. And I think we are precisely at that point where gaps open. This year, Globsec is a little different because we want to stress these dynamics and these trends. Uh, so we set up two stages. This is the stage uh, Maria Theresia, which is, you know, in a coincidental way, symbolizing that we need the roots, we need to think of the past, we need to draw from historical experience. This year, it's 300 years anniversary of coronation of Maria Theresia. She was coronated here in town. And actually, she was also uh, a leader at the time of the change. Uh, she was adapting the feudal system uh, to uh, a new uh, modern uh, Renaissance thinking. So there was a challenge like we face today before. But the second stage, which I welcome everybody to look at, is the stage we call the future stages. 
It's about the futures, not the future, but futures. Because, you know, how we behave, how we take the world, there are many possible futures. And there are many things where a lot of people do not appreciate enough how technology could change, how things like artificial intelligence, uh, communication, uh, the processes which we often with horror call the globalization, how these are going to change the world. If they are not resolved by conspiracies, by uh, whatever, you know, shadow cabals, it's just given by the progress of humanity often, and, and we to adapt to those. So I would welcome and encourage you warmly to look at the second stage, future stages, where a good debate will be going on. Adapting to the future cannot happen without everybody participating and taking part. And I'm hoping that Globsec is a symbol of that. It's a perfect public-private partnership. Here we got not only uh, an excellent, courageous uh, political leaders, uh, but also captains of uh, top business, business and industry uh, of the world, but also the best uh, brains of the think tank community. And I think I'm very proud, uh, and I can speak for all of our community, that this marriage has been working out very well, and uh, thank you for all for being uh, part of this. Let me finish uh, my introduction uh, with uh, thanks, uh, and thanks to our partners, because without um, support uh, of our um, strategic partners and exclusive partners and many others, uh, this would not be possible. Let me thank, uh, first of all, to our strategic partner, uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Minister Lajczak, uh, and uh, Visegrad Fund, uh, and to our exclusive corporate partners, which is BA System, Saab, Philip Morris, Lockheed Martin, Microsoft. I'm sorry if I do not mention all of those, but in all of your brochures, everybody is listed. Thank you very much for your support. And without any further ado, let me warmly uh, welcome Minister of Foreign Affairs, uh, Minister Lajczak, who is co-chair of this conference, by the tradition to open uh, this uh, event uh, with his remarks. Mr. Minister, please. Thank you, Ambassador Kacher. Good afternoon, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, friends of Globsec. Welcome to Bratislava, and thank you for coming here to take part in the 12th edition of Globsec Conference. I'm really pleased to see such an impressive lineup of speakers with excellent and deep knowledge of different aspects of foreign and security policy, and I'm looking forward to your presentations. And as we've heard, the organizers have prepared a very full program, and I'm glad that they've also added a new element to it, because indeed we know that uh, the innovations, new technologies, uh, informations age, and uh, using and misusing these new technologies have become an inseparable part of uh, security policy these days. Where we stand compared to a year ago? To begin on a positive note, the yesterday's NATO summit produced some good messages especially the strong message of transatlantic unity. The United States reconfirmed their commitment to Europe, and Europe made a strong pledge to increase its defense spending. And the new building is great, by the way. But the general picture is not so positive. Uh, there are not many reasons to be more optimistic than last year, and if you remember, we were not at all optimistic last year. The world is not a safer place, continues to be full of uncertainties. Not only future predictions are hard to make, it's more and more difficult to assess what's going on right now. The raw power politics is still dominating and the spiral of tensions continues to rise. Far too easily we are sliding back into traditional East-West confrontations and perceptions while we have still not been able to resolve the long-standing North-South paradigm. In many corners of the world, anger and frustration is boiling between the rich and the poor. Mistrust has taken roots between political and economic elites and ordinary citizens. The information boom has been abused to blur facts and truth with illusions and lies. Cyber attacks are more frequent and systematic, brutally attacking even the civilian infrastructure. Hybrid threats have taken the unpredictability of the conflict to an unforeseen level. Chemical weapons are again being used on the battlefields almost with impunity. And all these phenomena shatter people's belief in governments and state institutions, placing democratic systems worldwide under doubt and peace under constant pressure. Moreover, 
the number of unsolved or new challenges is rising with no solutions in sight. European Union is losing its first member, which also contributes to a global feeling of instability. The new US administration has to deal with both expectations and questions alike. New and reborn powers seek their role and pursue their interests with clear determination. And worse, dialogue has become a last resort instead of being the first option to avoid confrontation. And thus, as a result, we lack common answers to those many serious problems, as if we forgot that in our globalized, wo globalized world, no state or even a region is able to cope with these challenges alone. In this scheme, I strongly believe the time is ripe for Europe to, to rise up with more self-confidence. 70 years ago, when George Marshall presented his groundbreaking plan, he used one sentence, very simple one, which was hidden in the text, but it was very re relevant back then, and I think it's equally relevant today. And it says, the initiative, I think, must come from Europe, and the US should only help. Back then, as we know, it was more about economy. These days, it's about politics and security. But the message is the same. So I wish to see Europe, which is engaged and delivering, inside and outside. Otherwise, every next election in Europe will be, will be a nail biter, will be a fight between the pro-EU and anti-EU forces. The migration could spiral out of control again because, let's not forget, there are millions out there still wishing to get in. The terrorism will haunt Europeans, changing our way of life and questioning the very EU's raison d'etre. The Western Balkans could slide back into despair and nationalistic nightmare of the 90s. The Eastern partners will struggle to define their identity and to find their place on the map of the world. The transatlantic bond would falter. The European Union's soft power would fade away and the EU itself might drift into irrelevance. So I think these are all very good reason, reasons for, our, for us to expect and support the European Union to take its role as a global foreign and security player. To conclude, let me say a word about urgency. Yes, the pressure is in the air, and many are saying that we need to act quickly, and I agree to that. Time is not on our side, and many issues do require a swift action. Yet, let us not forget that in the end, it's the strategic thinking that will prevail. In practical terms, it means leadership and vision, not just constantly reacting to the developments around us. No matter how pressure, how difficult the issues around us are, hasty or instinctive reactions are not good enough. We need a bigger picture to be able to make a better assess assessment to plan our actions. And this is exactly why we need gatherings like this, and this is exactly why we need people like you. So I wish you very fruitful discussions, enjoy your stay in Bratislava, enjoy Slovakian hospitality, and thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Mr. Minister, uh, for your opening uh, remarks. And now let me warmly welcome at the stage uh, President of the Slovak Republic, uh, Mr. Andrei Kiska. Mr. President, please, the floor is yours. Welcome. Dear Madam President, Kolinda grabar Kitarovic, dear Mr. President, Andrei Duda, dear Mr. President, Rosan Plevnelio, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, it has been only a few hours since I came back from NATO summit in Brussels. This one was highly anticipated. Not surprisingly, it was the first summit of head of states and governments with the participation of the new US president. And let's be honest, in months since the U.S. elections, many of us in this room 
were worried about what to expect. Fortunately, our transatlantic bond is as strong as ever. We stick together, we guard each other's back. The alliance remains the backbone of our security. And moreover, we have a new ally on the board, Montenegro. All 28 member states are determined to fulfill their share of responsibility. This is also important for me personally as the president of Slovak Republic. Some of you may know that I have been very vocal about the half-hearted attitude of our authorities towards our NATO commitments. So I was pleased to announce yesterday in Brussels that government approved Slovak contribution to securing our allies in the Baltics through so-called enhanced forward presence. Moreover, we will join up fighting terrorism efforts of the alliance by deploying Slovak troops to Iraq. It also reaffirmed the commitment of the Slovak government to allocate more resources to the defense budget. Last week, the Slovak parliament approved historically the first declaration on defense spending and it underlines the basic fact that our security is not a question of political partisanship, but a matter of common responsibility towards our citizens. And that it cannot be provided but by others, but it can only be shared. Our people naturally want to live their lives without fear. Being in Slovakia, in Poland, in Bulgaria, in Croatia, in Estonia, in France. But whatever resources we spend on defense, it may never be enough. <coughs> to feel secure, we need trust in collective will, leaving no room for doubts that we would ever think twice before coming to help each other. This should be a clear message of all leaders of our alliance to anyone who would like to test us. So on the su surface, it seems that after turbulent months of full of uncertainty about the future, we finally managed to deliver some good news. I am not going to dispute it, but as some of you may know, there has always been some but in my opening speeches here at Globsec. This time will not be different. There are three things that worry me and I would like to address today. First, we struggle lately to maintain institutions of the West, be it NATO or the EU, as fellowship of truly democratic countries based on common values. Second, we allowed the enemies of the free world to get into our heads, to meddle too much in our own affairs. And third, we let our elections to be deformed into a survival game of our democratic destiny. So let me elaborate a bit more on the first point. I want to stress this. The West is not only a geographic concept. The modern West is a decades old and value-based partnership with NATO and the EU being the two institutions vital for our survival. That said, the European Union is not just another trade area, but the single most important project of peace and prosperity in the history of our continent. 
NATO is not purposely firepower pool that bunch of countries put together to defend themselves. Surely, we are the alliance of common interest. But more importantly, we are the alliance of common values. It is the core of what we are. It is unquestionable part of our security. Our values are our strongest survival weapon against any enemy. That's why we can act globally as the advocates of the human rights and the respect for dignity of every single human being. Our values are the unique reasons why we are the good guys. Whether it is freedom of speech, freedom of media, respect for NGOs, or fight for good governance, none of them can be betrayed. Without the genuine will to tender democratic principles in every single member state, our ability to act together could be compromised. Now, let me explain the second point. What I mean by talking about our enemies getting into our heads, especially holds through here in Europe. To put it simply, we should stop helping them to paint a picture of gloom and doom of Western civilization. Surely, we have been facing many challenges and security threats recently. Maybe too many in a short period of time. We are all horrified by terrorists targeting our people and our peaceful way of life. They murdered 22 innocent young men, women, and kids again in Manchester this week. Also, there are challenges in the EU we have to solve. A lot of hard work is needed. And there is always plenty of ways how something can go wrong. So my intention is not to downplay the difficulties of our situation or to underestimate the tasks we face individually and together. But let's stop playing the game of the enemies of the peaceful and prosperous West. Let's stop creating the picture of apocalypse just waiting to happen. Let's stop supporting the narrative of the EU and NATO being on the verge of terrible, irreparable breakdown. Let's stop seeing the need for revolutions and radical solutions when, in fact, what we need is old-fashioned politics and sober policies. Because what I see in our countries is still the best, the most prosperous, the most secure and stable place on earth for people to live in by far. And finally, my third point, which I think is the unfortunate outcome of the first two. We all have been reminded by a recent election how fragile our democratic societies could become. Once they are under combined pressure of dissatisfied voters, targeted anti-Western propaganda, and weak response from our political leaders. I think I will speak on behalf of all of us here when I say we have learned our lesson. We have witnessed too many attempts to hack our democratic societies recently. There is no need to play the Russian roulette about the end of NATO, the EU, or the whole Western civilization every time our people exercise their freedom to vote. We have seen enough. 
Now, our task as political leaders is to make our election like boring again. Seriously, we should do our best to calm down election races to battle of ideas stemming from our democratic societies. Not battles for survival of our democratic world. The elections in Netherlands, in Austria, and most recently in France paved the way in the right direction. They demonstrated that we can rely on our public when we show determination to find solutions and political courage to defend our common principles and values. Ladies and gentlemen, Georgian President Mark Velashvili, a good friend of mine, officially visited Slovakia recently. And you all know how difficult times this country and its people have had to go through. I asked him how they manage. And he answered, although complicated, the current situation is not a problem. The problem will be if we give up on our moral imperative and stop fighting for what is right. I agree. If we build the strength and the resilience at home, we can be more confident when dealing with international crisis, grave breaches of international law in Georgia and Ukraine, atrocities committed on civilians in Aleppo and several other cities in Syria and Iraq, are important reminders that our ability or inability to act decisively is crucial. We can't ever forget what defines us. Although we face many challenges and are busy with various problems, let our values and principles guide us. That is our single most important security policy, our unique adaptation toolkit. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Mr. President, very much for your candid words. Uh, I like your notion of Russian roulette. If it's with one uh, round, that can be a fun and thrill. If it's with six, that is a suicide. I hope we do not end up there. Uh, it's a special privilege and pleasure to introduce our President of Poland, Mr. Andrzej Duda, but I do want to welcome him not only on behalf uh, of the Republic of Poland, our dear valued member, well, neighbor, but also as the, the chairman and the president of Visegrad 4. Mr. President, floor is yours. Just a little technical note. Uh, the uh, speech of Mr. President will be in Polish. You will find on your seat uh, interpretation. A, it's English. B, it's Slovak. B, it's Polish. And C, it's for Slovak. Mr. President, floor is yours. Warm welcome. Excellency, Madam President, Excellency, Mr. President, our dear host, distinguished guests, dear friends, thank you. Thank you for this kind invitation and thank you for this kind introduction because it's a really great opportunity to meet with you here in Bratislava, in heart of Europe, on the Globsec Forum just a few hours, as Mr. President said, after the NATO summit, after the meeting of the heads of states and governments who discussed about security and also about the future. Not only a future of Europe, but also a future of our globe. Earth. Mr. President, Excellency, thank you very much for this invitation because today here in Bratislava, 
just after the NATO summit, we can discuss about the security of our globe, global security, from the point of view of our region, of Central Europe. So, this is the great opportunity to, to deliver this speech to you about our problems and about our, about our point of view for the future. So, please prepare your electronic devices because the rest of my speech I will deliver in Polish. Szanowny, szanowny Panie Prezydencie, Szanowna Pani Prezydent, Drodzy Przyjaciele, Wszyscy Dostojni Goście, Szanowni Państwo, jestem wdzięczny za zaproszenie i za tą możliwość wystąpienia podczas forum Globsek 2017 tutaj w Bratysławie. To organizowane już od kilkunastu lat niezwykle ważne wydarzenie gromadzi polityków, dyplomatów oraz ekspertów od spraw międzynarodowych już można powiedzieć z całej Europy i świata. To tradycja, to spotkanie, te dyskusje. Dziś podejmując w swoim wystąpieniu kluczowe zagadnienia jakimi współcześnie są bezpieczeństwo i stabilność, chciałbym się skupić na tym, o czym wspomniałem, na znaczeniu naszej części świata, Europy Środkowej w świecie globalnym. Otóż dostojni goście, szanowni państwo, wartość współpracy tego regionu, naszego regionu, leżącego situated between the Baltic Sea, the Adriatic Sea and the Black Sea is without any doubt growing systematically. It has been growing since we shook off the bond of communism and since we became again fully independent countries, since we have been part of the Western world. This has been a growth which I believe is bringing a fruitful contribution to the global peace, political confidence and economic stability. A practical demonstration of this are especially two formats of cooperation of Central European countries, to which my country belongs, that is Poland, and to which I personally attach huge importance. I have been attaching this huge importance since the beginning of my term as president. The first Format is cooperation of the group of eastern flank countries uh, within the framework of NATO, within the framework of the North Atlantic Treaty, referred to as the Bucharest 9. And the other format of cooperation is collaboration on the development and cohesion within the European Union, which is termed as the Three Seas Initiative. Now, let me use this opportunity and stress very strongly that Poland wants to be a unifying power and an active participant of both these formats of regional cooperation within two fundamental organizations of the Euro-Atlantic community, within the European Union and within the North Atlantic Alliance. Poland considers it as a strategic task in international politics, but at the same time also as a logical consequence of its membership in the European Union and in NATO. Poland wants to co-shape the transatlantic community through the regional community. It is precisely Central Europe which is the natural political environment for Poland. That is why we want and we are striving for its security, cohesiveness, 
and economic and dynamic from the economic point of view. At the same time, Poland is committed to making sure that both NATO and the European Union remain a unity. Just like security is indivisible within NATO, in the same way the development of Europe is reasonable only if the European Union remains to be a whole. As I said during the security conference in Munich, if the West is supposed to be strong, it will be strong only by its unity. If it is supposed to fall, it will fall divided. Poland also wants to make sure that the Euro-Atlantic community, through the contribution of our region, also remains open to new states. This is a crucially important task of Central Europe, to be an advocate of the open-door policy, both to the European Union and to NATO. It is in the interest of our part of Europe not to become a permanent border region, but to expand Euro-Atlantic bonds to the east and to the south. Therefore, we are advocates of extending stability. An important step on the path to turn our objectives into reality was last year's NATO summit in Warsaw. Back then, we took breakthrough decisions. They concern strengthening of the defense potential of the entire North Atlantic Alliance and of its further adaptation to challenges of the 21st century. In our decisions, we were led by the principle of the so-called 360 degrees, which means that security is indivisible in NATO states. The guarantee of that should be a priority of all member states of NATO, irrespective of where they are situated geographically. Central European countries have demonstrated that they have done their homework as regards this very important principle of building of the global peace. Prior to NATO summit, Poland, together with Romania, Bulgaria, the Czech Republic, Slovakia, Hungary, Lithuania, Latvia, and Estonia, decided to tighten their cooperation within the framework of the already mentioned Bucharest 9. And despite differences in individual concepts of national security, we reached an agreement on a couple of fundamental issues referring to defense policy. Among them was our conviction of the indispensable strengthening of the eastern flank of NATO through deployment of battle groups of NATO member states uh, in the Baltic Sea region as part of the so-called enhanced forward presence, and on the other hand, increasing the presence of NATO forces in southeastern Europe and the Black Sea region as part of the so-called tailored forward presence. As a region, we gave a solidarity-based response to the question how to best guarantee harmony and order in Europe. However, the aforementioned solidarity would have not come about without a feeling of responsibility on part of countries of Central Europe. As reliable members of NATO and the European Union, we take our share of responsibility for the European and global security. We want to improve the level of security through the expansion of non-aggressive deterrence and defense capabilities. Such a posture is presented by us through modernizing our own armed forces. We are decreasing our defense spending, we are modernizing the equipment of the armed forces, and we are developing our territorial defense forces. In such a way, Central Europe tries to maximize security guarantees to optimize the military potential of its own armed forces and, which is obvious, to minimize threats. An important aspect of the message which is going out from Central Europe is stressing the importance of international law. 
Its absolute respect is treated by us as a lodestar, which leads us in all our international activities. Therefore, we have consistently supported putting an end to aggression and for peaceful resolution of any conflicts. We are absolutely opposed to armed aggression. We are involved in the global anti-terror coalition and anti-Daesh coalition. In the most explosive regions of the world, we have been providing the indispensable humanitarian and training assistance. Central Europe is therefore not only the consumer, but, and I want to stress it very strongly, also the provider of security. Our region treats this in a comprehensive way. Therefore, we do not only want to invest in developing land forces, uh, maritime forces, and air forces. Individual countries of the region have participated in developing anti-missile defense systems. We are developing uh, also the cyber security in our countries. We are countering hybrid threats, including disinformation. This is our comprehensive approach vis-a-vis -vis security, and we have proved that in our activities uh, with, taken within NATO in Slovakia, the Czech Republic, Estonia, Lithuania, Latvia, Bulgaria, Romania, Slovenia, in Hungary, and in Poland. And there are centers of excellence established by NATO, which are functioning smoothly. Their basic task is to better prepare the alliance, among others, in cooperation among special services, crisis management, communication, strategic communication, or energy security. Ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, all of us are perfectly aware of the fact that security of our countries is strictly intertwined with the economic development of our states. Peace cannot be guaranteed without well-functioning market. On the other hand, the economic advancement will surely be stopped should a real military threat appear. The speed of economic growth depends on many circumstances. One of the most important factors is the adopted development model. Over the last couple of years, we were able to see which markets turned out to be most resilient vis-a-vis -vis the crisis and the slowdown in the global economy. That was the time of the global verification of how rational the principles were on which economy is based. Central Europe has passed that test. The countries situated between the Adriatic Sea, the Baltic Sea, and the Black Sea have demonstrated their resilience. They have proved that they are stable and their economies are robust. Our countries have, a, have efficiently limited their budget deficits, decreased public debt, and cut down the unemployment rate. We have remained to be a region attractive for investments. And here, business people from Western Europe, from Asia, or from America can come and conduct their businesses with success. Recently, next to the dynamic increase in mutual trade relations, we have deepened economic ties with the Western part of the old continent. Thanks to such instruments as funds from the cohesion policy of the European Union, we have come closer to the high living standards of the societies in Western and Northern Europe. This impressive transformation would not have been possible, however, without the huge potential which is so typical for Central Europe. It makes us stand out. We can, and I believe that we want to use, a number of assets in our region. They create a catalog of competitive advantages which are decisive about the growing economic position of our countries. The place of Central Europe on the economic map of the world results from its characteristic features, geographical closeness and cultural closeness of the countries of Central Europe. A big discipline of public finances and diligence, as well as high professional qualifications of our societies. Modernization of our economic systems is, however, still an open process. Remembering, among others, those features, I have decided to turn the Three Seas Initiative one of the priorities of my presidency. 
Now, let me use this opportunity and stress very strongly, not so much the political as infrastructure and economic character of this initiative, which right from the start I have been conducting together with Madam President of Croatia, Kolinda Grabar-Kitarovic, who is present in this room with us today. Ladies and gentlemen, we have set up this Three Seas initiative thinking about an informal platform of cooperation between Poland, Croatia, Lithuania, Latvia, Estonia, the Czech Republic, Slovakia, Slovenia, Hungary, Romania, Bulgaria, and Austria. Our priority is to build infrastructure cohesiveness and economic cohesiveness along the north-south axis. This will multiply the positive effects of our membership of the European Union uh, by way of complementing of the already advanced relations between the East and the West. By doing so, we want to be not only beneficiaries, but first and foremost, we want to be co-authors of the European unity, the unity which is expressed through a dense network of roads, rails, flight connections, and energy connections. The success of the three CIS initiatives is a guarantee of smooth functioning of the common European market and increasing in the credibility of our region, not only vis-a-vis -vis European partners, but also vis-a-vis -vis the global partners. All these issues will be discussed by us during the upcoming second Three Seas Summit, which will be organized in Wrocław in July this year. We want the Three Seas Initiative to bring effects such as increased innovation of our economies and societies. The implementation of tasks which are so ambitious uh, requires us to continue our cooperation among the Three Seas states. This initiative is addressed to a broad group of recipients, businesses, experts, local governments and state-owned companies. This openness for different milieus, for different groups, and let me stress this very strongly, is the DNA code of this initiative. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, I can see a certain important similarity between our discussions today concerning security here in Bratislava and the discussions which will take place in July in Poland. Uh, during the latter meeting, we will discuss about economic development. No matter which of these important regions, important topics will be discussed, we are joined in the conviction that a safe and subjective Central Europe is an important element of stability and development of the Euro Atlantic world. Therefore, once again, let me thank you for inviting me to Globsa conference. At the same time, I would like to draw your attention to the July Three Seas Initiative Summit in Wrocław. There we will be able to follow up on the discussions which we started today on the dynamic community of Central Europe, which is the community of aspirations and ambitions alike. Thank you very much for your attention. Ladies and gentlemen, I recommend uh, careful uh, attention because I think this will perfectly set the stage uh, in a very challenging way. What is going on in the world and will give you a very plastic and uh, an interesting image. So Nick, please let me uh, welcome uh, your panel and uh, we will wait for a couple of seconds until uh, presidents uh, leave the room, but I think speakers can already uh, take their seats. And there will be a couple of free seats for those who, are, who, are, who, who stayed outside and cannot get place. As we got vacancies in front, please refill the room. There will be more free space here. All right. Um, very good to be here again. Can I encourage, we don't want to speak to a third empty room, so can I encourage, if you want to, come forward, please? Because um, as some of you have seen in recent years, We've made this kind of thing interactive, and I want to start with you right at the beginning in a moment. So um, as people come in from outside, and please take these seats uh, at the front as well, I'm giving you a one-minute notice of a brainstorming. We have mics in the room. 
I want you to be thinking about the kind of things uh, that should be still on the agenda here. Because we are talking about global trends, but I'd like to suggest that in reality, this is not just global trends, it's do we really get what is happening? What's the direction of, of travel? And what's the scale? And it could just be that even in this very extensive agenda for the next two days, there are things missing. And what I want to do is encourage the panel to address some of those issues as well. So I'm giving you that minute um, really for you to think of the kind of things which, you are, which others are not thinking about. Remember where we were this time last year. Brexit hadn't happened. President Trump hadn't been nominated, let alone elected. Look at what's happened in France. Look at so many things that have happened. And look at what wasn't on the agenda, not even mentioned here. I'd like to quote and remind you what the president said a moment ago. We have learned our lesson. Weak response of political leaders, he said. Um, he also added, we need old-fashioned politics. But the foreign minister added something equally important. Leadership and vision should not be constantly reacting. Hasty and instinctive reactions are not good enough. That means for those of you in companies, those of you in governments, those of you in public service, that's your job to come up with the left field, right field idea of what's coming down the track, however unpopular it might be to your political leaders who are thinking in a more conformist way. So you've had 50 seconds so far. I want to get the microphones moving around for 10 minutes before I invite the panel up. They're going to stimulate you as well. We're going to run for the next hour and 20 minutes. So who'd like to come in with ideas of what is yet not yet on the agenda? Jonathan Isle from Rusi. Please, let's make it quick, quick. Otherwise, I'll simply say, you've got no ideas. And we'll move on to the panel. I would like to take the, 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 the sort of the position or the idea put by our Slovak colleagues on, on the subject of this uh, Russian roulette of elections in Europe. The very uh, narrow escape that we seem to register every time we have an election in Europe without actually killing off the hydra of the fundamental problem a uh, backlash against globalization, a uh, fear of a younger population about the future employment opportunities, a feeling that our institutions are not working. So we have not dealt with a uh, populist problem when we continually engage in the Russian relationship. That's a very big challenge, and there are already issues here, Jonathan. Thank you very much. Um, Parakana, who's technically still a millennial, he'll be talking as a millennial in a moment. Anyone else, please? Yes, over there. And put your hands up, and then we can get the microphones to you, please. John Roberts with me thinks We have a problem of identities. You've got, in Britain, large numbers of people who do not know necessarily what identity they are accepted as having. Take, for example, many, not all, but many Muslims in Britain. They're perfectly happy to describe themselves as British but they're not English, even if they live in England. All right, John, what identity. Happens, what happens if Britain breaks up? Right, Ident oh, that's a different one, identity. Right, OK, could it be the disunited kingdom? Please, who would like to come in? OK, all of you, oh, please, over here. Yes, hi. Hi, um, Elena Karasilova, University of Kent. Um, Global Security Strategy 2016 um, put at the center of the strategy the concept of resilience. I would like the panelists, if possible, actually to comment whatever, po whatever there is a moment on resilience, because the concept actually is quite complex. So that is how can we enable resilience, especially in the neighborhood, but also within Europe itself, uh, on prescription? Does it work? How can we build resilience and self-governance of those states? Lovely, thank you. Anyone else, please? Anyone else? You're right at the back. Anyone else over here? Yes, hello, uh, Natalie Nugaret from The Guardian. I, I um, am struck that as we contemplate all these events that you've mentioned, Nick, we, we're still uh, missing a picture, a wider global picture that includes, that includes the mention of China. Um, China is building the One Belt, One Road uh, project 
um, we, we tend not to look at it when we have these discussions about European security architecture and values. But I think we need to think about this because it's, it's also going to be a big part of the future. Particularly after the big meeting last week. But Parag is going to talk exactly about that. So you preempted him. Anyone else? Please. Please, yes. We've got five more minutes, no more. My name is Karl Kovanda from Brussels and Prague. And um, I was intrigued by President Duda's observation that he doesn't want Poland to be a border country, number one, and number two, that he's standing for further enlargement of NATO and the European Union. Ukraine is the obvious uh, question that comes to mind. And Ukraine is a country with tremendous uh, tr tremendous weight in Europe, and I don't know that we're giving it enough attention. Thank you. All right. Let me encourage you down the issue of resilience, about identity, what Jonathan Isle mentioned about the very serious issues of automation, of AI, and all this other stuff coming down the track very quickly, which politicians have to handle the overarching themes here. Anyone else, please? You're all comfortable with the way the world's going. That's great. Okay, fine. So you don't need to be here for two days. Right. Anyone else, please? You've got four minutes now, and then uh, Jakob will be speaking. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm the Australian ambassador in Vienna, so I come from a very different part of the world. I've just come from Sydney yesterday. <laughs> Good day. Great. Great. Well, you'll understand that there's a massive security dynamic going on in Asia and the Indo-Pacific as well. I want to reinforce the point made earlier about the importance of China. That is a bigger, longer-term game than Russia, and attention needs to be paid to that. There are massive proliferation problems in, with North Korea, but the key point I want to make is there's a huge liberal democratic resource out there beyond Europe that needs to be harnessed for global purposes. And I'd point particularly to the countries of the Western Hemisphere other than the United States, particularly the emerging Latin American countries, who are a tremendous uh, force for democratic values. Thank you. And I think it's interesting, having been at the Australian Leadership Retreat in Gold Coast last week, the way that there's already disaffection now growing significantly in Australian parties as well, political parties too. Anyone else, please? So it's not unique to Europe and where everyone else comes from here in Latin America. Anyone else? Right, I'll close the tab then. Right, let me, in that case, invite uh, Jakob to, to join us on the platform. Um, what I'm going to do is invite the other panelists up in a moment, but Jakob, uh, who is Jakob Vishnevsky, who is the Vice President of Globsec and the Director of the Policy Institute here in Bratislava, uh, until last year was the Polish Ambassador to the OECD. Give us your three critical points, Jakob, which really need to stimulate even further debate. And what I'd like you to feel is that this is a conversation not just a panel talking to you. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you very much, Nick. Um, it's sunshine outside, but this room is just going to be about uh, more darker. Um, and I want to talk about three witches. Sorry for this demonology. Uh, they, they keep the Globsec Policy Institute staff awake at night. Uh, our research revolves around three big topics. And th these are just like the three witches from, uh, from Shakespeare's Macbeth. They prophesize about the future that will happen if we ignore the warning signs. First, the world of rules is tottering. Paradoxically, a few decades ago, it were liberal intellectuals who advocated for deconstruction of common narratives. Post-structuralism was in fashion. This exercise beha became a hobby of every John and Ivan all over the world. We learned to deconstruct. Do we know how to reconstruct something new and workable? The unipolar moment of the US-led uh, world development is definitely over. The EU is being laughed at in many corners of Europe and the world. While we are waiting to create new meanings to fill the void, others step up. Illiberal democracy is on the rise. Some countries stand by the rules only when it suits them. Let us not get depressed, though. There is always hope. Technology makes us more prosperous, better informed, safer. Industrial automation uh, promises new heights of manufacturing productivity also loss of jobs. Big data helps us to enable government and businesses to better serve citizens. It also creates temptation for abuse. 
Think of the impact of technological change on the international relations. Once upon a time, the UN loftily debated human rights issues in the New York City bubbles. Um, suffering people had no effective voice. Now, those victims have mobile phones. We also pictures of Syrians after lethal gas attack. Citizens around the world have new ways to keep an eye on what their leaders are doing. These changes create a new sense of shared global responsibility. If you walk down the road and see a man flogging brutally his wife or his child or his dog in the garden, you probably think it right to intervene, or at least to call the police. Why should it be different at the international level? Can national sovereignty uh, be a, a shield protecting tyrants who are persecuting their own citizens, their own people? Not really. But as Iraq and Afghanistan and Syria clear, clearly show, it is one thing to identify a moral cause for intervention, it is quite another to work out what exactly to do. Citizens now use technology to follow their leaders. Government use technology to follow their citizens. This is why we need the world of rules more than ever. And here comes the second witch, the open model of society, which is vulnerable. The empires of the future are the empires of the mind. I'm quoting Winston Churchill here. In the world that our children inherit, what defines a superpower will not be weapons of mass destruction that can never be used. It will be ability to combine and to build the power of mass innovation and, the, and mass teamwork. This is why our mindsets are so important. Are you someone who feels that Muslims, uh, Roma people, asylum seekers, Brussels bureaucrats just wait to do your harm? Or do you think it's a big beautiful out there, a big beautiful world out there full of opportunities? Well, the choice for openness does not come naturally. Globalization has made some people really confused. People want to take back control of their borders, of their professional lives, of institutions that, that they are governed by them. They are angry at the elites. It does not help that wages are not growing fast enough, societies are aging, and um, uh, the people become risk-averse. These are, these are, there are countries who aggravate the problem. They want us, the West, to fail. And um, they preach the might is right principle. This is asymmetric war of ideas. They practice propaganda. And propaganda is like cooking a frog. The water is heating up slowly until the frog is cooked. Can we wake up and jump out of the water before, uh, before it is too late? Yes, I believe we can. Third and last trend is that we are living in post-truth society. Politicians have always flirted with untruths, to put it mildly. Now, lies, however, have become systemic. Subjective per perceptions are increasingly more important than facts. Lies spread like fire. The media are in crisis. Journalism is no longer neutral. We eliminated the gatekeepers who verified whether a given story is true. Dissemination of fake news is so easy. Anybody can be a journalist with a smartphone or a useful idiot spreading lies. So social media have become information war weapons. Fact-checking is needed. We should empower people to think critically. It is in the interest of social media to help the public authorities to find solutions. Media literacy could be the curriculum of pupils at school. We in the West have our stories to tell uh, about the world of rules, about the benefits of open society. We just forgot how to tell them. We have our own appealing emotional narratives. Ladies and gentlemen, before I finish, it would be the tragedy of all of us if the West became mismanaged, divided, inward-looking. There are things we all can do. We as Globsec staff, you as Globsec honorable guests. 
you will find some policy prescriptions of my institute in our publications outside this room. Defy the negative trends. We are not by, bound by fate to fail in our efforts like poor, wretched Macbeth. If only we pay attention. Beware of the free witches. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, Jacob. Right, uh, global trends. Anyone want to add anything to the mix from earlier, having heard Jakob? And let me invite the, the three panelists on the stage. Professor Steve Walt uh, from Harvard University, Stefan Dion, um, who is currently about to be the ambassador for Canada in Germany. Next week it'll be formalized. He's designate technically, but also a new post for the Canadian government uh, in Europe as a special envoy. And finally, Parag Khanna, who's a senior research fellow at Singapore uh, University uh, in the Lee Kuan Yew School, but particularly here, because he does represent the next generation, the millennials, who are not largely in this room at the moment, and because of the work he's been doing on connectography, which is going to address some of the things you've already raised. Let me put to you that global trends, and I was asked to chair a session about a vision of the world in 20 or more years, addressed from various perspectives. I said, 20 years, you'll be lucky if it's 20 months, maybe 20 weeks, maybe 20 days, maybe just 20 minutes. After all, it's easy in a session like this to say the world in 2020 or 2035, I should tell you that's only seven hours away if you look at your watch. I'm not being facetious here. This world is moving incredibly quickly. So um, Stephen is going to talk about geopolitics in a moment, um, particularly because of what he says is that there are many certainties in the world. Stefan is going to put the geopolitical context on it as well. And first of all, though, I'd like to ask Parag, who, picking up on what Natalie said, you heard, yes. Parag, um, you've come here from Singapore via Bangkok to talk about exactly that, about the impact of this on our assumptions of global trends. So the deal is that Parag's going to give I have a few minutes for remarks. Everyone's going to have a few minutes for remarks, but I'd like you to come back very quickly after each person has spoken in case you want to clarify, add, or uh, move, the, uh, move the discussion in a slightly different direction. I should also say, Facebook Live, we welcome you. You're watching us, and uh, we're feeding into you. So this discussion is not just about here in this room. It's about vast numbers out there, not just those watching, having coffee next door. Parag, the floor is yours. Thank you, Nick. You should have told me about the Facebook Live earlier. I would have uh, had my phone out. <laughs> but anyway, um, I'm uh, delighted to be here. Thank you, Nick. And uh, thank you for, for starting us off in a very from a global perspective and uh, identifying this time horizon. Uh, perhaps just the next few years, because I think in the spirit of what Steve also said earlier, there are <coughs> certainties that we should be taking uh, or, or having taking into account uh, for the rest of the conversations. If we can start, I have a couple of images that I want to share just to kick off the conversation uh, that aren't going to go into some of the issues that you raised yet around uh, populism and uncertainty, uh, but I think, again, should inform the conversation. So the first image, uh, if we can get the first slide up here. This shows you today. Today already, China ha is the number one trade partner of more than twice as many countries in the world as the United States is. That's today. And so when you ask yourself, when you look at how much time our media has spent focused on the transatlantic trade and investment partnership, the TPP agreement, neither of which, unfortunately, is moving forward, thanks both to uh, European leaders and the US in the former case, and certainly uh, the, the Trump administration uh, in the latter case, though, of course, uh, Barack Obama himself had, had sort of uh, been forced to uh, diminish his support for the TPP, you should not be surprised to know that this is not only an image for today, but it's probably only going to deepen and expand in terms of the number of red lines uh, on the map uh, in the years ahead, because Western countries are not as aggressively pushing for uh, free trade agreements or trade liberalization the way Asian countries are. And in the absence of TPP, what you'll see is that on the right side of the screen, if you will, some of the uh, even more Asian countries are going to uh, uh, be, be even more wedded closely towards uh, China. Now, that's not just a map. 
map of trade in a way, because historically, in historical patterns of, uh, of geopolitical change, trade relationships become investment relationships, investment relationships become strategic relationships. So again, looking at this, why should it surprise anyone to know how much more active China's, na China's Navy wants to be, for example, in the in Indian Ocean, or the fact that it's opened up a base of some kind in, uh, in countries like Djibouti. Uh, that will only uh, continue to expand as those red lines become more fixed. And a China slowdown, an ever so slight or, or even a significant slowdown in the Chinese economy, doesn't change the fact that it is really the largest trade partner for now uh, two thirds of all the countries in the world. If we can quickly look at the second slide as well, and that will help us to isolate the geography of uh, the eastern two-thirds of, Eur of Eurasia. Why is this map interesting? Well, what you don't see on it is a very important statistic. Most of the world's population, uh, more, than, more like 60% of the world's population lives on this two-dimensional image, right? And uh, I've almost purposely crafted it to uh, cut off at the Black Sea. So we're not, where we are sitting is not yet on this map, but two-thirds of the world's population almost lies just uh, east of us here, stretching all the way to the Pacific Ocean. Now, Nick referenced earlier the, uh, the Belt and Road Initiative, the One Belt, One Road Summit that, that, uh, that took place last week in Beijing. And this is a map that shows you what major um, uh, high-speed railways, uh, uh, ultra-high voltage uh, 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 electricity cables, um, uh, uh, let's see, uh, oil and gas pipelines and so forth are going to be developed. And you all saw this in the news, I hope, the incredible enthusiasm with which dozens and dozens of countries turned up. And this is actually a story that began 25 years ago with the collapse of the Soviet Union when China began to lay these foundations of infrastructural connectivity reaching from uh, from east to west in this direction. And I think to Europe's credit, Europe has been very positive uh, and in a way uh, breaking, if you will, from US pressure not to participate in the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, the One Belt, Run Road, and instead, turning up there to participate in what is, and I think that is a map of certainty. That is not just a map actually to 2020, Nick. I would put that as the map of 2040. And I can say with some certainty, having traveled those Silk Roads for the last 20 years, that a lot have already been built in the next 20. I expect all, the re all of the rest to be built. And I expect Europe and Asia to really come together into, uh, into this mega continent. And many of you may not know, as you follow trade and economic dynamics, we tend to think of the US-EU trade relationship as the single largest inter-regional inter trade relationship in the world, more than $1 trillion a year of goods and services. But the EU's trade with China, plus its trade with India, uh, ASEAN, Japan, Korea, and Australia, so Asian countries, is already far larger than its trade with the United States. So for those of you here in this room who want to adapt to the future, uh, I think you could be very well served by looking and mapping out uh, the infrastructure linkages and the trade relationships that, that you collectively have with Asia because they are already larger than your relationships with the United States. And that's before you have any meaningful trade agreements whatsoever with Asian countries. And it's before many of these Silk Road corridors are even built. So which brings me to the third uh, and final map just to kick this <laughs> off. And this is a map of uh, Europe's energy grid. This is particularly just oil and gas pipelines. It serves several purposes. Uh, first of all, it's a reminder of just how integrated Europe already is. It's fine and well to focus just on Brexit and to see the glass as half empty, uh, but this is a reminder that Europe is also in many ways an egg that cannot be unscrambled. And the, uh, the energy sharing uh, across the uh, region is one very good example of that. So this is uh, uh, existing oil and gas pipelines, and the dotted lines are some of the proposed ones. What I think is very interesting here is that the eastward connections that are, that are being built, uh, so additional north stream routes, uh, potentially south stream, and so forth, the point is really that there is a growing energy diversification that is helping Europe build energy resilience. It's no longer the case that, uh, that, that Russia you know, singularly dictates Europe's energy uh, flows. We should look at North Africa, we should look at the Arctic, and we should look, when we look east, at Russia, uh, across Turkey, and of course, uh, to Iran. And this is another case where I think the eastern side of this map helps you understand the extent to which in the coming years one very significant issue, and I was very glad to hear the word earlier this morning, self-confidence, 
right? European self-confidence is going to be pivotal in deciding how Europe as a region, Europe as a collective, deals with Russia, Turkey, and Iran. Three countries that are getting, obviously, very negative headlines, in some cases, uh, in some instances, deservedly so, but are crucial to your energy future, to your economic future, to your future export markets. Europe already is the leading investor in these three countries and is the leading market for exports uh, for these countries. And therefore, it's very, very pivotal that Europe come to a coherent, cohesive, and, um, and comprehensive strategy towards these countries in the years ahead. And I hope that we can uh, it, it map more connectivity to these regions and use that connectivity as an agent of stability uh, in the coming years. Thank you. Quick question then. Um, European self-confidence. You, you say Europe has to have self-confidence. Do you believe it does at the moment? Um, I think that there is an opportunity to return to the, a period in time when there was less existential angst about the future of the Eurozone. And I hope that with the French election and the perhaps predictable outcome in the German election, that they, we will once again have a strong Franco-German axis that's pro-solidarity uh, and that's pro-sort uh, of unity in European foreign policy. And those would be two very important elements. Stefan and Steve, can I just ask you to pick up on those points that Parag's been making about, about this? How much is this understood in Ottawa? I mean, I can imagine that if, uh, if that first map about China was on President Trump's screensaver, he might sort of froth at the mouth before he's even opened, uh, opened up his, uh, his Twitter feed in the morning. <laughs> Steve, what, what, do you, what, what is your reaction? Do you think this is understood in that way that Parag has put it? Uh, I don't think it's understood in the way he's put it. I think that there are many Americans, including President Trump, who are obviously concerned about China's rise and what it means, certainly what it means for the American commitments in Asia and elsewhere. The real debate in the United States, and it's going to be the issue we really wrestle with going forward, is whether or not China's spectacular rise of the last 30 or 40 years will continue or whether the accumulated liabilities China is facing and in particular its demographic challenges are going to be overcome in the next 10 or 20 years. Uh, I, I'm actually much more optimistic about where the United States is going to be vis-a-vis -vis China, but I think there's no question that the Sino-American relationship and how that plays itself out over the next 10, 20, 30, 40 years is going to cast an enormous shadow over the rest of world politics. Stefan, you were foreign minister until very recently. How much does Ottawa get the scale of the challenge from China, whether it be one belt, one road, or more broadly? It's a challenge, but it is an opportunity as well. Is it seen that way? Uh, by some and by the government that I represent. We have a debate in Canada about can we open talks and negotiations with China on free trade. And some are opposed to that, saying China is not a democracy, uh, their human rights record is appalling. And the reaction of the government I represent, uh, Justin Trudeau's government, is to say the world is not what we would like to, but then engage the world. And if Canada is uh, open to trade with China, it may be beneficial for the uh, human rights record of China. But if we isolate yourself and we come with the megaphone politics by the sideline and, and criticize the world and pull out, what will be the relevancy of Canada? It will not be good for our economy, but even for our ability to influence the world, it, it would be negative. Jakob, do you think uh, China, and I'm being provocative here, could be classed as a fourth witch, judging by what you said earlier? No, no, I, I would not treat it like that. I think it's an opportunity for the world. We are all richer because of China, because Chinese input uh, to the world. The problem is that the international institutions after the Second World War were created and uh, there was no uh, space, uh, there is no space for them, at, uh, sufficient space for China. I'm talking about, say, IMF, World Bank. I, uh, I used to work at the OECD and there was endless questions among ambassadors, among the staff, whether we should like to, to, to take China on board as a, another members, member state. But then it appeared that Chinese do not want to be part of the OECD because they know that they are go going stronger every day and in future, the standards will not be uh, imposed by the West, but they're going to have to be negotiated along with the Chinese and other emerging economies. Steve, let me just pick up uh, on what uh, you, you believe that the future world order is not entirely unknown. How does what we've just heard from Parag have to be calibrated by policymakers, given the expectation that was put on leadership 
from those first few remarks this morning from the presidents and certainly the foreign minister? Yeah, well, let me talk a little bit about what those leaders are going to have to grapple with and things we do actually know if you think out 10, 20, 30, uh, 40 years. Uh, we actually know an enormous amount about what the population profile of the world will look like. We know that China will have about a billion people, so will India. We know that the United States will have in excess of 400 million people, and by the way, will be substantially younger than most of the industrialized world as a demographic profile. We know that Europe's population is going to decline and is going to get older. We know that uh, the population of Russia is going to decline even more dramatically and get much older. We know that Japan is going to decline even more dramatically and get much older. And we know that countries like Uganda, Ethiopia, and Nigeria, uh, their populations will double uh, by 2050. Think about that for a minute uh, as you sit here in, in Europe. Um, so we know a lot about the future world in terms of population. We also know a lot about wealth. We know that the members of the G20 today are likely to be the members of the G20 going forward, at least most of them. We know that France will not turn into Bolivia. We know that Burundi will not turn into Singapore in the next uh, 30 to 50 years. Uh, that the countries that are wealthy and powerful today are going to be the countries that are wealthy and powerful uh, going forward. How they manage their problems uh, remains to be seen. Uh, but what does that mean if you trace all of these trends out? Uh, Asia's relative importance will continue to go up. I'm sorry to say, as I sit here, uh, Europe's relative importance is going to decline. That doesn't mean Europe is declining as an absolute sense, but as a relative share of wealth and power, it's it's going to decline. The United States, I'm still relatively optimistic if we don't uh, inflict too many wounds upon ourselves, and we're capable of doing that, uh, as, uh, as we have seen, but I'm relatively optimistic because all of the advantages the United States has traditionally had in terms of geography, natural resources, innovative population, uh, etc., uh, will continue. There are some things we don't know. We don't know what the future alliance structure around the world is going to be because alliances are malleable. NATO, I think, today is more fragile than it was 20 or 30 years ago. The American alliance system in Asia, I believe, will be maintained, but is going to require some deft diplomatic maneuvering in uh, the years ahead. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's more fragile than perhaps uh, would be ideal. Uh, second, we don't know what the future ideological environment looks like. 30 or 40 years ago, millions of people believed in Marxism, Leninism. Uh, n hardly anybody does anymore, except in a few isolated uh, university towns. Um, <laughs> but uh, the few, and, and extremist ideologies such as the things that have inspired ISIS were completely marginal 30 or 40 years ago. I think if you look forward, how ide ideologies, norms around the world evolve, much harder to forecast that. And my third, uh, very difficult to forecast unknown, is what the nature of the scientific and technological environment is going to be. We are, in fact, terrible at forecasting what the technological frontier is really going to be like because we're very bad at anticipating how different technologies will be combined in various ways. And all we have to do is think about the last 40, 50, 100 years of all the things that people got wrong about what was going to be technologically possible. Which means leaders in 2030, 2040, 2050 are going to be wrestling with scientific and technological possibilities in biology, in artificial intelligence, etc., that haven't even been conceived of. And that's what political institutions are going to have to deal with. Um, if I add all this together, I would basically characterize the period we're moving into as the third phase of the post-World War II order. First phase was the bipolar Cold War. The second phase was the brief period of American unipolar dominance. And the third area, I think, is going to be a sort of multipolar but very lopsided, uneven world where China and the United States are the two most powerful countries. Not in that order. I'd put the United States ahead. And the other major powers will be distinctly less. I want to end on just one final provocative generational note. As we think about all the things that happened in 2016, we think about that in demographic and generational terms, consider that if people older than I am, I'm 61, if people older than I am were denied the right to vote in the major democracies, there would have been no Brexit, there would be no President Trump, Marine Le Pen would have lost by an even larger margin. Right, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. In other words, many of the disturbing trends you can point to in our politics over the last year or two are in part because 
old people continue to vote. And if you want to be an optimist, <laughs> those younger people are not likely to change their political views all that much. So democratic politics may in fact be improving once people like me get out of the way. Thank you. Steve, do you want me to shift this discussion to ban the vote for old people? <laughs> no. <laughs> I, that was not a proposal, that was an empirical observation. I think you've just made a headline. Uh, Jonathan, um, uh, I'm not going to suggest which generation you're from. Jonathan Isle from Rusi. And Natalie, do you want to come in on China, uh, what you heard from Parag? Would you just like to pick up these points at all? Yeah, the microphone there, please, Jonathan. Well, I, 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 just, just to answer your challenge, Stephen, uh, the sad thing about young people is they also tend to get old. Uh, the people who voted for Brexit now are the people who voted to stay in the European Union when Britain voted in 1975. That's the sad thing about young people. Um, now, to just to a, a more direct question on China, if I may. On the subject of uh, Stefan's point, the... It's a false dichotomy that you are putting. Nobody is arguing about isolating China or ignoring China. The question is what kind of an engagement with China? Uh, do we allow the Chinese to simply scoop up all the high technology firms in Europe, which yep. is what they're doing now under uh, the win-win uh, definition, which usually means that China wins twice. Uh, so that, that, is, that is the first point. And the second point uh, to Stefan, um, you said Marxism is dead, but would this alliance of autocracies, this view of China as a successful autocratic uh, uh, system uh, that produces, generates goods, would that poison the liberal order that we have? Right, St Stephen, Stefan, and Jakob, just stack up one moment. Natalie, on, particularly on, just on China, while uh, we've had what uh, Parag has said, okay. please. Yes, thanks. Those were very, very interesting maps. Um, my, my question, I suppose, is how do we um, take that in and defend some of the things that were said earlier today, which is that um, our, the global order or the, and, the, and, the, and the institutions that we care about are based on values. So how do we embrace China's rise, if you want to look at it in a very positive way, which, is, which was, I think, the tone of your, your, your talk, uh, W while keeping in mind that we are uh, values-based uh, democracies. And that, I think that's going to be a key issue. Just one, one example of this. We always, we, we, we spend so much time analyzing Russian propaganda. What are we gonna do tomorrow when actually China starts spreading more you know, of its notion of news and uh, inf influence across Europe. How do we deal with that? They are doing it already, I yeah, think. Um, uh, Steve, there was a question to you, but uh, Parag, what, what, what's your view? And Stefan, you've been dealing with them as a foreign minister recently. What, what, uh, picking up both what Natalie and, and Jonathan have said, does anyone uh, else want to come in on, on uh, China specifically? Okay, I'll come to you in a moment, please. We should not yeah. underestimate... Oh, uh, sorry. No, no, please sit down for the moment. Yeah, sorry. We should not underestimate the challenges, but we should face the challenges. And so, of course, it's awfully difficult to negotiate with a country like China, but we need to do so. And we need to do so open eyes. But we cannot pretend that if we don't do it, we'll avoid the problem. If we uh, go uh, with, uh, as I said, uh, megaphone politics by the s to the sideline and to criticize China and to pull out, in which way will improve the situation in China. So, no, I think we need to, um, uh, to, to face the world, and I'm convinced that then our democratic tools will be assets for us if we, we use them wisely facing the uh, autocratic world. Uh, you, have you raised those points that Natalie raised about values particularly in your bilateral discussions with China, and what, what's it like when you do? I think our values are key. And one of them is the sense of responsibility. That means what are the consequences of what we are doing for others and for ourselves? Because if we have abstract, conce con uh, abstract conception of our values, saying since they are not a democracy, they don't have the rule of law, we'll not deal with them, we'll ignore them, we'll bash them, then what are the consequences of this behavior? In which way it will improve the world? We know that the world has been improved, but the world is far to be perfect. Steve. So then engage the world, 
strong of your values and your convictions. We're not going to stay on China indefinitely, but there are important points here about global trends, no, Steve. Exactly, and I would say we, sh we shouldn't overestimate the degree to which the Chinese model, such as it is, as it is, is attractive to others. All right, I will be far more concerned when I discover European and American uh, billionaires buying condominiums in Shanghai because they want a safe place to go to if everything falls apart in the West, as opposed to what's happening now, where Russian oligarchs buy r real estate in London and wh where Chinese millionaires want to get visas and property in the United States so that they have some place to go. That suggests that there is something about the Western model that they find attractive, whether it's stable property rights, rule of law, uh, places to educate their children, and uh, air you can breathe. Uh, all of those things are relatively appealing, so I don't think we want to be selling ourselves too short too soon. No. Parag, let me just pick up on some of these critical issues, particularly what values, what Jonathan was saying, but also the other point about the robotization, the automation that's coming in, the artificial intelligence, the algorithms, which in the end, as we've seen with Foxconn and other companies, in China are already destroying jobs. Mm -hmm. What does that mean for the stability of China? Let's start with the question about sort of world order, because it's not really, first and foremost, a values-based question. It's about the distribution of power. And Steve is right. The relative power of, of Europe and even the United States, to some extent, is declining. We're moving into a multipolar world, but it's not a multipolar world in the sense that we know from European history. It's a global multipolar situation, where you have uh, superpowers, great powers on every continent at the same time that are freely developing various kinds of relationships with each other, some based on values values, such as uh, trans-Pacific uh, uh, security arrangements that the United States has uh, with Japan and with South Korea. In other cases, just based purely on complementarities, on supply and demand. So the fact that Europe has already such deepening relations across uh, Eurasia with China and other Asian countries doesn't mean that you are suddenly importing Chinese values. The, the fact is that right here, this country, Slovakia and also Hungary, have built into their economic plans to be uh, passageway hubs, junctions for Chinese-built railways coming to Europe, and even from railways coming up from the Piraeus port of Greece up through uh, here through Central Europe. So already European countries are reorienting their economic thinking around the growing trade and uh, relationships with Asia. That doesn't mean that suddenly you are uh, becoming Asian in terms of values. One can transpire without the other, and that opportunism, that commercial opportunism that European countries are, are pursuing is, of course, very important for your uh, for your economic growth. Uh, a country like Germany, for example, is getting attacked by the United States Treasury for having large trade surpluses. But meanwhile, from their point of view, they're finding ready markets uh, for their exports uh, in the Middle East, in Asia, and they're aggressively looking outward. And so clearly, that's a one reason why the German economy is so strong. And others in Europe want to be like that as well. Now, what Asia is doing uh, when you refer to these job-displacing technologies is trying to move away from being primarily commodities or manufacturing-driven, uh, particularly the manufacturing manufacturing that has been the cause of the East Asian economic miracle. Of course, a lot of jobs in emerging markets, in uh, those labor-intensive areas that have been the drivers of economic growth and prosperity, those jobs are going to disappear a lot faster than anyone thought they would. Uh, and as they do, that's going to put pressure on Asian countries to focus much more on services and on consumption. And that means they're going to have to obviously liberalize their economies more. They're going to have to privatize. What about the social pressure on governments? There is a lot of pressure on governments, but remember that these are, these are countries with very large populations like China, but they also have very high savings rates, right? And they have very large, um, they don't necessarily have, even if they don't have current account surpluses, they have very large savings, they have large currency reserves, and uh, they are in the position to invest ever more capital. That's what they have been doing. Let's remember that when it comes to China, Every time you turn on a Western television station like CNBC or Bloomberg, you're going to have 10 people, one after the other, say that China has been over-investing, it needs to stop investing, there are all these ghost cities, and it needs to start just consuming, consuming, consuming. The truth is that China does both. Right? It invests a lot and it consumes a lot. And that investment has been absolutely critical as a driver of new, new uh, areas of the economy, like e-commerce. The reason Alibaba is a multi-hundred billion dollar company today is because of all the infrastructure investments. So they are finding ways to continue to create jobs, even as jobs are getting lost through automation. Right. What I'm doing is layering this discussion, and Stefan is going to give us some remarks in a moment to take forward some of the discussion points. But picking up on what all of them have said, let me just recognize two others, please. I can 
only just see you. Can we have some lights on here, Kevin? Thank you. Hi, I'm Matt Rhodes from the George C. Marshall Center. Um, one of the usual suspect issues for uh, future security panels that hasn't been issued, is, hasn't been mentioned much, is climate change. I'd be interested if the panelists uh, imagine that affecting geopolitics and geoeconomics. Right, let's just pause that. Uh, Ambassador, do you want to come in on China? Uh, yes, I do. Thank B you. Because much. China is something that Australia is wrestling with. Well, let me just first say we've been watching China incredibly closely for 20 years. So we and our relationship with China is a very strong one. It has two parts to it. And we do have a free trade agreement with China. We're very happy with it. We also have one with Japan and one with South Korea, which is tremendous for our economy. And China is a tremendous source of investment, and it's a great country, and it's going to be an even greater country. So engagement is crucial. But how do you engage? And let me say, we do a number of other things in terms of our conversations with China. We have a very active human rights dialogue with China. And the best method we've found with China is be direct and challenge the values because the big question is, what will China do with its future greatness? Will it be a part of a rules-based international system or will it try and stand outside it and get outcomes by using raw power? And I don't think any of us want the latter. But you have been concerned about the buying up of Darwin, uh, the pushback on trying to buy ranches like Kidman. In other words, it doesn't come with a comfortable relationship. Well, uh, it's not a bad relationship. The only reason that we've said no to some uh, Chinese investments is because there's been a national security dimension. But almost all Chinese bids for investment in Australia are accepted. We're quite, happy, we're quite happy with that foreign investment. On the other hand, we're not at all happy with how China's been acquiring territory in the South China Sea. So you can do both, and I think European countries already know about this. It's a rough patch with Russia at the moment, but for many, many years, people managed to work with Russia whilst at the same time standing up to Russia on some issues. And Chinese students are keeping many universities uh, in, the, in, the, in the black. Absolutely. Right, please. Uh, can um, you keep all your remarks brief, please? Short. Little John. mention of India. Hang on, we're, we're still talking about China at the Ch moment. So yes, if you I want know, to talk about China, talk about China. Little mention of India in connection both with China, the One Belt Initiative, and its rivalry. And also, when are we going to address the question of values? And we've the question of whether we've Turkey already talked about that uh, 10 minutes ago. Is going to be a Please, issue. microphone there. Thank you. Teresa Fallon, Center for Russia, Europe, Asia Studies. Three points. Uh, you mentioned the Belt and Road Initiative conference, but no one mentioned how Moody's downgraded China's credit rating on Monday, so it kind of took the shine off the Belt and Road Initiative. The Europeans refused to sign the document, so it doesn't show that European cooperation. The Europeans are very annoyed by um, the, the lack of uh, openness in the Chinese economy. What we're looking so for, though, is strategic okay. tra changes and so strategic trends. True, but ch you, you had this incredible map, and it, you, it makes it appear that it's inevitable. But the reality is that the Chinese economy is slowing down, and the, the trains going that you mentioned across uh, Eurasia to Europe are returning empty. So we call it Obao, one belt, one way. <laughs> so how can this continue? Mm -hmm. um, that's the issue about connectivity, and uh, uh, okay, and what about this post-globalization world that Credit Suisse talks about? We're assuming that this is what the world's going to look like, but the world has changed. We've had three decades of China growing very rapidly, but now it's slowing down. So All right. this isn't inevitable. Thanks. Just pick up on that in a minute. One more. Is this about China? Yeah. Alan Riley, Institute of Statecraft. My point about China is simply this, the strategic play for the West, and the lady was referring to this a little in, in, a, in a previous question. The strategic issue is we've had 35 years of enormous amounts of growth. And the idea is for policymakers that this will continue on a straight line trajectory. This surely isn't true. The, 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 the key stat I would give you for this is the um, total Chinese debt, corporate, local, and central, is 283% of GDP. But the, key, the key thing is, is that two thirds of that has been generated since 2008. And it's the devil, when you understand the level of debt creation, we realize China probably won't collapse, but what we're looking at is stagnation. And how you deal, deal not with the PR of One Belt, One Road, but the reality of long-term Chinese stagnation. And what is the Western response to that? And it seems to me that the issue of stagnation is actually the early to mid 21st century issue of how we deal with China, and indeed, right. the issue that China has to deal itself. Right, I'm going to just have one round on the, on the panel, and then move on to other issues from Stefan can lead on that. Stefan, again. Your, your assessment, I know your, your responsibility is Europe at the moment, but more broadly, when you're looking at it and you hear that, that worry about stagnation, is there a danger of seeing China just moving up? 
But China will move up if we move down uh, com in comparison with us. But can we then focus on our strengths as well? And can we make the right decisions as countries and governments and populations? Uh, if uh, I may come back to the question that had been asked to us for this can panel. Can I come back to that in a moment, uh, if I may? Uh, uh, I just want to then cap China and then move on to your points, if I may. I, I think we have strengths that China doesn't, and one of them is democracy. Okay. Uh, s circulation of, 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 uh, of uh, ideas, uh, scientific freedom, uh, academic life, a free press able to criticize us when we are making mistakes, the ability to say the truth about the situation of our, of our uh, environment, our water management, uh, to, to have a free uh, justice system. We cannot underestimate what that means and in which way it may, it may make it difficult for China to cope uh, with what we are able to achieve, if we use these tools properly, and it's what I would like to develop now. Steve, is there a danger of uh, seeing things only inexorably in one direction with a country like China? A absolutely. I would just uh, reinforce the point that was made here with another observation that, of course, if you look at China's population, it's going to have by far the world's largest elderly population. In yep. fact, uh, it's enjoyed over its remarkable run over the last 30 or 40 years a really almost perfect demographic profile with a very large slug of population in their prime employment years, their most productive years. That's about to change. Because of the one-child policy, they actually are going to have a huge labor shortage having to support all of those increasingly elderly people. So China is about to hit a sort of perfect storm demographically in terms of its own productivity. I don't think China is going to collapse or anything like Thank that. Stagnation, but stagnation. certainly, uh, certainty stagnation is a real issue. Um, there's a second set of issues which perhaps we'll get to on what this means for the sort of geopolitics it's of Asia, but I think we yeah. probably ought to move on to some right. other areas. Stagnation, Parag. Well, I just want get, to get to one point first, which is about reciprocity. So the concerns that, and this relates to values, because when you deal with China, uh, as the gentleman from Australia said, you know, having values is an important part of the conversation, and not wavering from that is important, and demanding that they not mm -hmm. come to your country and presume that they're still in their own is extremely important. And this applies very much in terms of trade and investment. So you are within your rights to determine what is a national, what is a, uh, a sort of strategic asset that foreign investors are not allowed to uh, take ownership of. Every country in the world is now doing this. This happened in Canada after the Nexon deal where the Canadian government said, uh, you know, this was, uh, this will be allowed this time, but not next time when it comes to upstream acquisition of energy assets. Just remember reciprocity. Just demand reciprocity. And that's why the European business community, and I think this was the implication that you had in, in your comment as well, um, just demand that, that everything be mutual, everything be reciprocal, that it be win-win in the Western sense of win-win, not in the Chinese sense of win-win is probably the best thing you can do with China across the board, trade, investment, values, and so forth. And that's and a stagnation. Um, let me be honest with you, it's, it's far too sort of uh, uh, oversimplified a conversation we're having uh, about China. A country, an economy of that size does not simply stagnate overnight, not because of the level of debt in the economy and not because of the fact that it's uh, an aging population. Neither of those, and in addition to the other five major issues that China is confronting, such as uh, environmental issues and, and uh, obviously concerns about the future of its political evolution, you can take all of the problems that China has, and after all, every problem that China has is the biggest problem in the history of the world, uh, and yet still, it's not going to mean that, uh, that China and Asia more broadly is not going to be wedded to and bought into and, and participating in this broader Asian growth story. And China's composition or China's uh, driving that story may decline, but others are going to step up. And, and, and India actually is one of them, of course, because India now has that perfect demographic profile. It won't even reach um, uh, having the majority of its population of peak working age until actually past the year 2030, and it's already the world's fastest growing economy. Mm -hmm. It did not send an official presence to the One Belt, One Road Summit for diplomatic reasons, but far more importantly than any one particular event is the fact that it's the second largest shareholder in the Asian Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank. So it wants to be a part of, and every country surrounding China, and China has more neighbors than any country in the world, pop quiz for you geography uh, buffs, uh, 
Um, and so every country wants to be a part of that growing uh, connectivity, and they're going to continue to, and that's going to be part of a part of a new model of Chinese growth, if you will, because they're going to keep exports strong as those economies grow. They're going to be in. They're going to be asset owners of all of these infrastructures that are being built. They're going to generate revenues from that, from the utilities, from the transportation. There's all sorts of ways in which China will continue to grow uh, that most people aren't really talking about right now. All right, now we've got 25 minutes to run. Let me, Stefan, let me pick up with, I said we were going to do it in stages. Let's meet, uh, go to the fourth stage now. Your, your thoughts about the trends which are coming down the track, which can be either identified or at least pointed to. Thank you, Nick. I uh, will come back to the question that has been asked to us to prepare ourselves for this panel, and it was, uh, how can we keep the world safe and moving forward with so many contradictory interests and challenges. So I thought in my mind, I'm facing a so prestigious moment, how can I encapsulate what I have to say? And my view is these interests are not contradictory. They must be not only balanced, it's not the right word, they should be combined in a way to reinforce each other's. Let me give you some examples. And if we do that, I'm confident that when, uh, when the President Kiska said we need to be optimistic and uh, we should not overreact to every problem, I think he's completely right. If we choose this idea that we may reconcile our goals instead of opposing them, I will give you a couple of examples. First example I have in mind is NATO meetings. I, uh, it's my third NATO meeting yesterday. At the beginning, the first one, there were a big division within NATO about the attitude facing Russia. And there were the ones that were arguing for deterrence and orders for dialogue. And yesterday, there was consensus that we need both, and we should not oppose the two. Canada has increased its sanctions against Russia, increased its support, concrete support to Ukraine, and increased its dialogue with Russia. Because we know that the goal is to find the path to reconciliation, in order to avoid a situation where we are spending so much of our investments and resources to have deterrence in the east part of Europe, instead of working all together to develop Africa and to uh, strengthen our relationship with Asia. In order to go there, we need both deterrence and dialogue. There is a consensus on this right policy. Another example I may give to you is, there are some that are telling us in order to have economic growth, you need now to, um, to build this only on the market and to stop to have the, all these spending and social programs and so on. That's, that's a big mistake. We have all the evidence that shows that the path to economic growth is fighting inequalities. Fighting inequalities in a way that is, that is clever. But it's clear that the societies that are the strongest economies have large middle class. They help up their, their kids to find the ways to develop their talents. They are safe in the streets. They have good schools, good hospitals. They invest in it. They invest in their universities. And it's what we are decided to do under uh, Justin Trudeau to be sure that Canada will have a strong middle class. We have asked the richest part of our country, the 1%, the richest, to contribute more in order to give a tax release to the middle class. We have uh, invested a lot in uh, childhood development because this is the way to have a strong economy. And another position that we are doing that is completely false is diversity and unity. We are told that in order to protect the cohesion of our countries, we should close the door to too much diversity that will weaken our society. If it's well done, diversity will be an asset, not a threat. We have all the evidence in Canada and elsewhere that the companies that are the most competitive in our markets are the ones that have been able to tackle the, within all the strengths of their workforce. And this diversity became an asset. It's certainly the case that my country has been developed. And if it's possible in Canada, I don't see why it would not be possible elsewhere in the world. Another example is trade and social progress. It depends the way you negotiate a trade agreement. Of course, it may be a race to the bottom for uh, worker protections, food safety, environmental standards. It may or it may not. 
if you negotiate, pro negotiate it properly. And I will argue strongly that what we, Canada has negotiated with the EU, the CETA agreement, is exactly that. We'll be stronger for the environment, stronger for uh, worker, workers' rights, food safety, and so on, and we'll have trade. Don't choose between the two. And finally, climate change has been mentioned. It's a terrible threat for humankind. We need to realize that at the end of the century, if we are three to four degrees up to uh, what it was in pre-industrial uh, uh, level in, in terms of warming, it means that life on this planet will be much more difficult to sustain. And we need to avoid it. In, in even the Paris Agreement, if each country reach their uh, target of the Paris Agreement, we are still in a world of 3 degrees Celsius instead of 2 degrees Celsius, as we hope we will be. So we need to work stronger on it. But for that, we should not oppose the environment and the economy. I bet you that the countries that will have the best economies will be the ones that will have less waste, will have clean tech technologies uh, and clean sources of energy, and it, it, that will invent the solutions and spread it to the world. And I only want that Canada will be one of them. And it's why I argue in my country for a strong policy regarding the environment that makes sense for the economic development of Canada. So inclusive and sustainable growth is possible, and it's something we need to achieve. Thank you. Let me just pick up what uh, the foreign minister said earlier about the challenges for leadership, because in the last 20 minutes, let's focus on that, picking up what all of you have just said. Jakob, you talked about end of rules, mindset, and post-truth society. If conformity is coming to an end, and we have the foreign minister saying leadership and vision is not, should not be constantly reacting, hasty and instinctive reactions are not good enough, and there's a w the president said there's a weak response of political leaders. Um, what I'm getting at is what is the structure of governance in all of this which can make this uh, manageable at least? Is this beyond now leadership to handle this? Whether corporate leadership or political leadership or are they constantly going to be struggling to catch up? One thought for you at this point, Steve. The future of major international institutions, not just NATO, but even the World Bank, the Bretton Woods Agreement. Um, I think they're, they are probably uh, intact for the foreseeable future, but the confidence in them is, uh, has eroded somewhat. Uh, but that's not where I would go with this, if, if you don't mind. Uh, I, I think what we're seeing in our politics of the last year or two is not at all surprising. Uh, we began the post-Cold War era with this extraordinary optimism, right, that uh, liberal market capitalism was going to gradually spread around the world and everyone was going to be part of the end of history, as it were. Uh, and then people were told that, you know, you could create the euro and that wasn't going to lead to any problems. Uh, and you could expand NATO endlessly and that wasn't going to lead to any problems. And you could keep increasing the size of the European Union and that wasn't going to lead to any problems. You could deregulate markets and that wouldn't lead to any problems. You could promote globalization everywhere. That would not cause any problems. And you could invade Iraq and that would just solve problems and not create any new ones. All right, well, after that track record, and where almost uh, none of the people responsible for those various decisions were ever really held responsible. And we then go through the financial crisis, and we go through what's happened in Iraq, and we go through what's happened in the rest of the Middle East, and you ask yourself, why suddenly in 2016 are people everywhere not happy with current elites and turning to people who not only promise them magical solutions, but basically promise to take them back into the past? to make a country great again, right? As opposed to pointing them towards the future. It's not at all surprising at all. So it seems to me the task of leadership going forward, among other things, is to start holding existing democratically elected leaders and elites and the people who advise them somewhat more accountable for both what they do right, but also for what they do wrong. I'm doing a big project on thinking the unthinkable, which comes, which shows very clearly most leaders in the corporate world and the political world and the civil service, public service world do not want to think how bad things could become. You are from the Kennedy School of Government, so you know everything. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> you train leaders of the future. Are you telling them to almost ignore much of what you teach them in order to think differently, the next generation that Parag represents? A absolutely not. What we tell them is Was that, that a not or yes? Absolutely not. We do not tell them to ignore everything <laughs> they've been taught. Uh, what we do tell them, I think, uh, among other things, is you know, obviously get trained in what the current sort of body of knowledge is, but try to have as wide a range of sources as possible. I mean, the central problem, I think, that's uh, at least in the, in the United States, uh, one of the reasons people have been so surprised by the politics of the last couple of years is the growing compartmentalization of our societies. People watch the TV shows that they like and uh, watch the news programs that agree with them. They read the newspapers uh, that they already agree with. Their social circles are very homogeneous. And suddenly they discover that Donald Trump is president because nobody they know voted for him. So how could this possibly be true? Um, and so one of the things I try to encourage my students is to you know, make sure you read uh, several newspapers and not all of the same political stripe. Uh, reach what do you mean is news platforms? News platforms, that's exactly right. Don't just go to whichever uh, websites you happen to like. Try to, don't follow on Twitter just people who have the same political views as you. Put a few people in your Twitter feed who uh, make you angry every time you read what they put on because that's the only way you're going to have some sense of what the current of opinion are. And occasionally, some of the people you disagree with are actually going to turn out to be right. All right, all of us are in dark suits standing up here. I do want to hear from other people who are not wearing dark suits and maybe come from the next generation. Parag, you are still just a millennial. Barely. By a couple of months. A <laughs> couple of months. But, but how much does this represent the fears of the next generation, the half of Africa who, don't, who, don't, who are under 25, who don't see what's coming down the track, the million a month in India who can't get a job? It depends on where. You have to remember where people are coming from. If you look at the relative circumstances of even people who are in their 30s today, in most of the world's geographies, Asia and so forth, they can remember when their own lives were much worse, let alone the quantum leap and the improvement in the standard of living that everyone who is above the age of 50 can remember it across the entire post-colonial world, which is most of the planet Earth. And so people, even in this kind of difficult period, um, you know, have, in most of the world, have an appreciation of that. They don't see themselves going backwards. Now, in the opening remarks, we heard a number of ministers uh, talk about the, the, the relative decline uh, in the quality of life or, or, uh, or uh, wages and incomes and stagnation, but that's applied to a certain few countries. And you're all familiar with the elephant curve that shows you how it's that particular decile of the population of the lower middle income uh, stratum in, uh, in, in Western countries, in particular, particularly just Western Europe and the United States, in the last decade and a half that has gained relatively less than the rest of the world has gained, but it's not to say that they're actually worse off in, uh, in material terms than they were. So we have to put this in context. We, I, I cannot be part of a conversation where we say that everyone is worse off all of a sudden and you actually pretend that you're talking about anything more than 10% of the world's leadership. population. So this is to Steve's point earlier about where you identified 2016. This is 2017 and it's actually, a t this is the tail end of a 10 year period when the global conversation on what constitutes good and effective governance began to change because it begins, of course, with the financial crisis. And then came, obviously, Occupy Wall Street and all of the movements around that, uh, the Arab Spring, Brexit, and Trump. So this is a 10-year period, not just uh, the last year. But, but Steve is absolutely right to say that one of the key responses to the last 10 years should be a lot more focus on political accountability and a lot more responsiveness of government to the demands of their population, which is, of course, the future voters, which is, of course, the young people, because many of the elder generation that just had uh, their voice heard in Brexit and elsewhere, it was their last stand, if you will. It was their last stand voting for Trump and their last stand with Brexit. What about the future? And I think the, the, the second pillar that I would add, because I agree with everything that Steve said, but an equal and important part of good governance is having a future plan. And he didn't quite mention that. And, and of course, at the Kennedy School, they're training you know, next generation leaders and teaching you what, to, what literature is to be in command of. But just let me just compliment that with what happens at the Lee Kuan Yew School, which was built and modeled on the Kennedy School 100%. But what we do is bring in every day of the week, every week of the year, entire delegations of Indians, of Chinese, of Emiratis, of Kazakhs, of Russians, from the entire five billion person catchment area that I was mentioning, that I showed you on the map, 
We bring in hundreds of them all the time, and we don't just talk about, you know, how do you make your regime more accountable? They, they, you generally know that they're suffering in that regard, <laughs> that they're weaknesses. But what we train them in is what is your plan for the future in light of technological disruptions, a more demanding population, uh, geopolitical volatility, demographic shifts, growing entitlement obligations. What is your country's plan? And what we need to see a lot more of, even in wealthy established uh, democracies that have had such a good run for the last several generations, if they want to maintain that, they too have to learn how to make a plan for the future because success is not guaranteed for anyone anymore. All righty. Stefan and, and Jakob, but I want to go to other people as well. Or should I go to them first? It will be short. It will be short. Okay. Uh, uh, I I in, kept too long. In, in a nutshell, uh, to, to say what I, uh, the way I react to what Brian said, I would say that globalization plus the technological changes, automation, and it's two different phenomena, but together, I've been fantastic to decrease extreme poverty in the world. Uh, in 1970, four human beings out of 10 were in extreme poverty. Today, it's about two out of 10, and it's decreasing very rapidly. But not so good to decrease inequalities within society, and especially within developed societies. And there, we need to make the, the right choices, and it's what I was suggesting. Uh, for example, to not oppose the market and the government, and find a way for the government to strengthen the market for everyone. Otherwise, you will have a growth that will benefit from the elite, but that for the 90 or 99 percent. And then they will be vulnerable to populist arguments. An individual or a party that will say, I am you, I am the people, elect me, I will toast these elites with, with their institutions, uh, their court system and so on, their universities, their science, and I will govern for you. Let me check. I mean, you can give us a reality check. You sat around the cabinet table in Ottawa. How much of what we're talking about today, the long term, however long is, how much is, do you have time to even consider these massive strategic trends, given the absolute imperative for immediate political management? I have that always in mind, always, in every decision uh, we are making at the government. This trend may be contaminate Canada at any time. No country is immune. You, you, if you dis dislocate the cohesion of your country uh, regarding diversity, r regarding the ability to have institutions in which people uh, feel that they are part of, and to not have always a top-down policy, but to announce in advance what you intend to do and to try to have the support of the people, uh, a populist wave may come in Canada very easily. All right. C but yeah, and can and I you will have democracies still, but more illiberal democracies than democracies with the rule of law. Hmm, okay. Who, who's got the microphone at the back, please? Uh, you, you, please, at the back. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. My name is Daniel Barta from CID Budapest. And uh, you just uh, came up slightly with a question, but, but you also had a question before the panel, what is missing from the program, what do we believe sure. is missing? And what is missing extremely is Africa. Uh, Africa is totally not there. I think we have one speaker. No, we, have, we have talked about Africa. Yep. But we can't talk about everything in detail. Uh, not, in, not in details, but, but the question from a European perspective, because 10 years ago in all strategies suggested that the key continent where we can make a difference is Europe, it's going to be Africa. And it seems that we are losing the capability to initiate major policies, at least in Africa. Furthermore, now more and more in European policies, we are referring Africa as a threat, threat of migration, threat as a, a stronger economic power challenging Europe as well in many sense. So how do you see the role of Africa in, in global dialogues and in, in European dialogues? Thank you very much indeed. Milan Nietzsche, I'm from here. I'm recently with Globsec, now with German Council on Foreign Relations, DGAP. And let me try to bring this discussion to here, to this region. I mean, elaborating on, Nick, on your challenges uh, for uh, leadership and governance, and Minister Dion, you mentioned model of Canada, which might not work here. Some of its elements might, but others would not. What would be your one advice or one challenge to these countries that you would highlight? And let me acknowledge that this, in this region of 65 million people, Globsec, uh, sorry, uh, Visegrad group represents four countries and four different reactions to some of the challenges that you have mentioned. Some countries are in the Eurozone, some are not. Some are in the margins of the EU, in quarrel over values, building special relationships with Russia or China, some are not. So what would be your advice to leaders of this region? 
What right, is just, just store that up for the moment, please, here. Anyone else, quickly? L the lady here in the front, please. David Cadillon, School of Economics, LSE Ideas. I'd like to briefly defend uh, old people, actually, if I, if I may, uh, because the, uh, I have to say I don't really share the panel's optimism about youth people not voting for, for populist parties. Maybe it's coming from my you know, old age, this pessimism, but to give you old one age. example, yeah, uh, it's, uh, it's ironic. To give you one example about the French election, uh, first, first uh, figure, the two categories that voted more massively for Macron are the 60, 68, and 70 plus. And in the first round, you had 51% of the 18, 24 who voted either for Marine Le Pen or for far left uh, populist uh, Mélenchon. My hint is that it has to do actually about how technology impacts politics. And I'd like to get the panel's view uh, precisely on this point, how technology impact the way it relates to politics, especially among the, the younger generation. And particularly Thank data you. mining and things like that, please. I'm Tisami Kitvi from UAE. I'm heading a think tank, Emirates Policy Center. My question, what is the future of globalization taking in consideration? Now, United States, who is the head of globalization after Trump, is uh, calling for isolation and also the Brexit. On the other side, China is now uh, moving for and uh, encouraging the globalization. So this is my question. What is the, the future of uh, globalization? All right, let me ask each of you to pick up whatever you want. Jakob, uh, mm -hmm. what, what's your view, given your three principles, about the way this is now uh, beginning to stake out? Mm -hmm. I, I want to, to address this issue of Central Europe because um, uh, Bratislava, Slovakia, Visegrad 4, Central Eastern Europe is increasingly part of a global chain, global economy, but I think that mentality is still falling behind, uh, which means that th these countries uh, have uh, made the choice, geopolitical choice, uh, um, 20 years ago to be part of the EU, NATO, but, but still uh, these days uh, with uh, self-doubt uh, coming into the heart uh, of uh, um, Western civilization, European project, um, uh, it's kind of um, uh, easy to be tempted uh, for uh, other forms of cooperation, be it 16 plus 1. China likes to rule and divide, tries to pick up uh, um, countries from the region and um, uh, um, develop cooperation uh, through their own rules, by setting their own rules. And I don't buy the optimistic talk uh, of uh, presidents who, by definition, by their profession, have to be optimistic and talk about uh, a NATO summit as uh, uh, being very successful, etc. Um, just look at us, uh, how we study the body language of people, how they behaved uh, uh, during the NATO summit. Uh, it means that we are t all terrified. Uh, how will the leader of a free world going to behave? Uh, will, he f will he throw the table uh, out uh, uh, and uh, reject all the rules, or will he support everything that we have built uh, after the Second World, uh, world War? Uh, the point I'm making is that we are extremely uh, sensitive, uh, in extremely sensitive moment, and Central Europe is particularly vulnerable because this layer of institutions, uh, free market economy, is just uh, 20 years old. Uh, and uh, we have conducted uh, public opinion polls here in, here in uh, uh, Slovakia, in Bratislava, but going also beyond to other uh, countries of the region, and we see that young people, especially young people, they are uh, confused, they are afraid, uh, they follow social media, but they don't know what uh, really truth uh, is. And, and do you think the political class is in touch with that reality? No, I don't think they, they are. How much is there a mind. shock there, which we've just heard from Stefan, uh, well, I, about I, I what he worries about or had worried about as a minister, sitting at the table wondering about something which is going to hit the Canadian government at high speed they didn't see it coming. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I think that there is a growing divide between what young people uh, think about and what politicians uh, have uh, to offer uh, to them. Uh, there were recently uh, protests uh, in Poland about ACTA, about legislation uh, concerning uh, property rights, and you can see that politicians are living in absolutely different uh, world stratosphere from, from uh, young people. Steve, how much is this a really profound problem. But also, let me throw in for the last three of you quickly, when Steve Bannon says, I, our uh, administration is up for the deconstruction of the administrative state, is that something which large numbers of other governments around the world are wondering if they're going to embark upon? Uh, I, 
I, I find that argument, actually, Bannon's argument, uh, completely baffling. Uh, because one of the things that's, I think, powerfully associated with a global successful globalization and successful societies uh, are, in fact, effective administrative states. The more exposed you are to international trade, as my colleague Danny Roderick has shown, the more you need an effective government to manage those trading relationships and to manage the social and economic consequences at home. So the idea that you can be engaged with the rest of the world and slowly let your government fall apart is complete nonsense. It's got but a 32% reduction in the State Department budget is not exactly an investment. No, absolutely not, and completely short-sighted. I could give you a long uh, disquisition, which I will spare people, but that's uh, absolutely uh, counterproductive from an American uh, point of view. My central point here is, though, that no society I know of has ever improved itself by cutting itself off from the rest of the world in terms of education, in terms of people, in terms of trade, in terms of investment. Um, it's never been a long-term strategy for success. The only uh, appropriate strategies, and you even see authoritarian governments, of course, being forced to do this, is engagement with the world in a variety of ways and the development of government competence, which means not running down governments or trying to take them apart, but rather getting the very best people to welcome government service. Uh, I worry greatly uh, about whether or not the sort of Trump example will be contagious in other places. I think the, the quote-unquote uh, marginally good news is that that experiment is likely to go so badly that most other countries will not want to imitate our experience. Hmm. Stefan. Well, populism is wrong. Protectionism is not the right way to go. Racism is wrong. But in order to avoid all, all that, we need to look at the problems we have. The youth of France and Spain and Italy and many countries between 25 and 50 percent of unemployment. What do you do with that? Because if you do nothing, of course they will think the institutions are against them and they need to have a strong uh, man or woman that will speak for them and toast uh, these old uh, institutions and people. So in order, to, in order to avoid that, you need to have a good strategy indeed. And I think the government in which I am has a good strategy, but we are ready to debate it. In order to debate it, you need to have strong institutions, strong parliament, strong parties of the opposition, strong press, and dependent judiciary. Don't dislocate these institutions, otherwise you will damage your countries, and you will damage the capacity of your countries to be competitive in the world. Finally, Parag, I mean, you, your, your, your work is about connectography and picking up the, uh, the lady from the UAE, from the institute there, about globalization. Can you imagine that some of those l maps with those long arrows going from China, that some of those are going to become cut up or perforated in the coming period or not? Is globalization, to put it broadly, here to stay? Or are there real pushback um, instincts and forces at work which could could lead to this uh, reflection of populism, which means there is less globalization? There's, there's never going to be less globalization. It's, uh, you would only think that globalization is reversing if you don't know what globalization is, quite frankly. If you think of globalization only in terms of the volume of containers that are on Maersk ships going from port to port, if that's your understanding of globalization, then you could make a case that there's going to be some reduction. But the fastest growing category of trade, if in case you only want to talk about trade, is in any case digital services. And services don't require that kind of infrastructure. There's a reason why the technology companies and telecoms of the world are investing billions of dollars in more high-speed fiber optic cables because that is how money is made today, is by, by trading those uh, bits rather than atoms all over the world. So I don't worry at all about the future of globalization. I think it's much more interesting for us to talk about what categories of globalization are going to be even more robust at even faster rates than they are right now. That is the correct way to understand if you really, if you really break it up into these different categories. The real, and one of the most important reasons is really a geopolitical one because globalization is not some neutral phenomenon that just sim simply magically manifests itself, it's always been an imperial enterprise. Globalization is what happens when America wants to push outward, when Europe wants to push outward, and when China wants to push outward. Uh, all at the same time, you get the volume of globalization that we have today, which is incredibly significant, greater than at any other time in history. And so the more powers that you have in the system that want to expand their influence, by definition, the more globalization you're going to have. The question is, as the spider
writers compete in the web, uh, who's getting the upper hand over whom? Not, not how much globalization you have. So it's the wrong question that many people uh, are asking. More importantly about the uh, administrative uh, uh, state, I think, you know, Steve Bannon uh, he, he almost came late to the party. America has been deconstructing the administrative state from the entire period between Reagan and Newt Gingrich. Uh, if you're not, if you recall 24 years ago, there was this thing called the Contract with America in which Newt Gingrich, as Speaker of the House, more or less with the final nail in the coffin in uh, having the kind of uh, 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 sort of high quality civil service and federal service. And it's been degrading and degenerating uh, from way more than a generation now. And so if you want to, uh, Steve is absolutely right, both in theory and in practice, uh, if you want to be a successful state, you have to be a globalized state and you have to have a very good, very strong administrative capacity. And it's something America completely lacks today and needs to rebuild from scratch. Parag, thank you. Parag, Jakob, uh, Stefan, and Steve, thanks very much indeed. For me, the headline is Steve saying old people shouldn't vote. But um, <laughs> <laughs> So whoever's tweeted that, you've got a story there. I um, didn't say that. <laughs> <laughs> no, I didn't. If, they didn't, if they didn't vote, outcomes would be very different. <laughs> you know what happens on Twitter. <laughs> I do indeed. Can I thank you all very much indeed. We've tried to identify global trends. I apologize if you're frustrated that we weren't dynamic and imaginative enough, but you've come up with good ideas. More to come in the next two days. Service message, uh, refreshments outside in the foyer, uh, back in your seats here at 3 o'clock for the next session with the Visegrad foreign ministers to talk about the challenges of Visegrad, 3 o'clock, and in the Danube space, which is the new space, downstairs, 14.45, quarter to 3, the discussion uh, on navigating your way through the fourth industrial revolution. Thank you very much. Have a good lunch. Thank you, Steve.